Welcome, Alistair. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Pleasure. So what, what I'd like to talk about, uh, uh, you, this interest in space, which I guess you have to do with the, you know, did, did you bring up the idea of the Aerospace Centre? So actually, I'm not so interested in space. My interest comes in aviation. And the reason I live in this beautiful part of the world is uh, because of the gliding centre at Portmoak. Uh, so um, I uh, had been a glider pilot uh, down south where we lived uh, in Sussex and when we came north uh, I joined the Scottish Gliding Centre here uh, near Kinross and it, um, at that time I was living in Bears Den so I was mm-hmm. commuting across to get to the gliding centre at weekends. It took me 16 years to dig my wife out of Bears Den and get her across here to to live in uh, Kinrosha. Uh, I'm glad to say 22 years later she loves it um, and what I found was I got immersed in the local community and didn't have as much time for gliding as perhaps I had mm-hmm. anticipated. Uh, but anyway I became uh, a director and treasurer at the gliding club and it became pretty evident to me that gliding as a sport was in long-term structural decline. Well, why was that? Um, mm-hmm. Cost and time, uh, I think, are the two main reasons. Um, Lots of young people enthusiastically start gliding while their parents are subsidising them, and then when they go off to university or whatever, um, and and they'll lose that uh, subsidy, uh, they they have to give up the the sport. and They tend to be away until their 30s or 40s, and then they come back. So tend to find that there's lots of older people who enjoy gliding Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it does take a lot of time and uh, perhaps in this modern age uh, people have less time to invest than than they might have in days gone by. So I was looking for a way to um, stimulate uh, interest in light sport aviation really and I... um, came up with the idea of creating a centre of excellence for aviation and I called it Aero New World Space, New World Kinross for the, f- the reason that I wanted it to be about flying. The idea was we would create the space and we would put interesting things into the space and we would introduce and invite interesting people to come and give talks and ah, so uh, share the exp- I've, I've seen the acronym, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Ken Ross because we wanted it here and the idea is to create jobs here and then of course having separated out the word space people latched on to that and I found uh, over subsequent years the tail started to wag the dog <laughs> um, and uh, yeah that's that's how we come to have now a focus on space and the things which is the more uh, sexy side of uh, yeah, the final frontier the offer, thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so where did the flying interest come from before you know the actual? Oh, I blame my father for that. You know, mm-hmm. putting me on his shoulders when I was a wee laddie and taking me to look at uh, these amazing uh, flying machines that uh, that we had back in the nineteen fifties. I go a long way back. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just something that was was latent until uh, in the midst of my banking career. I don't think it was a midlife crisis as such, but I, I, my interest was sparked again, and I started flying gliders, uh, and that's 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 what really. Did Did started. you never want to have a career flying? I did actually, yes, uh-huh. as a boy, but then I fell in love. <laughs> oh, and. Uh, <laughs> I, it wasn't appropriate to go and join the Air Force. I was um, Aye, that's a childhood joke. sweethearts yeah. with the lady with whom I still share ah. uh, my life. Yeah. Has she got a flying interest? Not at all. Not oh, well, that's probably all. quite good. Didn't yes. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, no, no arguments about, yeah. <laughs> about aspects of flying. Sure. So you went and, and you lived in Bear, Glasgow for most of your career. Is it? And, yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had. Uh, are you from? Are you from the west? I'm from both Glasgow, from, yes. Both from the west coast. We're both from there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Aye, aye. 
Spent six years working in London. Uh, uh, isn't it interesting in Scotland that east-west divide, yet there's, compared to other, there's no distance in it at all. I know. Uh, it's, it's such an interesting... And, and the, even the cultural difference, I've, I've lived in Glasgow before, and it just feels... Well, I haven't actually been for several years, but it feels so different in the centre of Glasgow to the centre of Edinburgh. <laughs> Um, I don't know what to say because uh, at one stage later in, in my career I ended up working in Edinburgh and there's definitely a different culture. It's quite marked uh, between the uh, the Ouija's uh, and the burgers. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's two. I've heard both these words but I've never put them quite together. As the... <laughs> um, I think I found... Uh, um, people in uh, the East, um, just a bit more reserved. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Glaswegians tend to be a bit in your face um, uh-huh. and uh, very uh, kind of open, wear their hearts in their sleeve, yeah. I think a bit more than. Yeah. I, I used to say that what the difference, the main difference I noticed if you were just in Glasgow wandering, uh, at a bus stop people would just automatically talk to you. Uh-huh. In, in, in Edinburgh that was less likely Yes, and also they would be more likely in the centre of Glasgow, it could be different now to be from Glasgow whereas in Edinburgh it, there was more people not not from Edinburgh mm. uh, That would have been my experience as well yeah. Mm. Yeah. I've noticed more in, in, in the properties I manage an increasing amount of tenants moving from Edinburgh to Glasgow Really? Yes. Uh, yeah. Why do you think that is? Is it cheaper over? A the change. Last? It was cheaper, although whether it's staying that way, I don't know. I I really don't know. Um, but they just have their different. I mean, it's only a small sample. They just have their different reasons. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Handing in their notice, they're moving to Glasgow. Mm-hmm. So, so good. Well, that'll be exciting. <laughs> well, my daughter who lives in Glasgow is desperate for us to return, but I'm afraid. No chance. I have to disappoint her there. Yeah. 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 Well, gliding, I, I went up in a glider over there at uh, Port Moak um, just probably when I was in my early 20s. It was amazing. Right. It was just, the, the bit I remember about it most, well, two things I remember. We went up in the plane, you know, the plane mm-hmm. pulling us. And as soon as the plane left, there was this strange, this complete different noise, silence. Not just the wind, there was the wind noise because you couldn't hear the plane anymore. And that was a very unusual experience. Mm. And then I got a little shock with the with the controls, and kind of pushing it down. And I remember the the um, instructor saying, "Now pull it back now." And I was just going for <laughs> it was like I was frozen in this downward dive, and he took control. And it was incredible. Yeah, I, would have, I can't remember it being expensive at the time, but you know, I guess it's different if you go for a, a trial experience to if you own a glider and things. That's where the, the cost starts to ramp up substantially. But it, the biggest uh, constraint is the amount of time it takes. You, you, know, you end up spending a whole day uh, typically at the gliding club. Um, so when you've got other family commitments and so forth, it's, it's, it's a big ask on the rest of the family. Even when you're retired? <laughs> Even when you're retired. Well, I know... I know um, do a wee bit of power flying, and the beauty of that is you can pop round, fire it up, and go off and do your thing, and come back uh, in half a day. Because there's this other place over at Balado. Is yeah, well, a... what we a few years ago, five years ago now, um, we decided to build a, an aeroplane at Kinross High School. Mm-hmm. So we bought a kit uh, from Slovakia. Uh, I imported it. I brought it up to Kinross at the tail end of 2017 and uh, constructed it at the school over the first half of 2018. And that introduced uh, pupils to simple aircraft design, you know, showing them narrow gauge steel frame covered in fabric and how strong that can be uh, supporting uh, flight. Uh, also introducing them to instrumentation and to engines and and the likes and then uh, once the aircraft was completed um, we we started to give pupils free flights uh, in the aircraft to introduce them to the joy of flight meteorology navigation flight planning all of that good stuff mm-hmm. um, so uh, that aircraft is now flown 800 hours 
and we have a second one on the stocks uh, this time at Strathallan School. Another build? Another build, same type, mm -hmm. and it'll be ready at the end of the summer. Uh, fantastic. I mean, it was a it was an incredible thing when Coco said she would have probably been part of that. This was your my daughter. daughter. My uh -huh. daughter, yeah. uh, that 2018, mm -hmm. that would have been when she was in fifth year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was amazing that she was able to do that. And, yeah. and I don't remember having to pay anything for it. No, you didn't, uh, because we're a charity, and uh -huh. um, what we the way we've organised it is the we get a cohort of um, pilots together who have a, a wee bit of altruism about it. Pilots sometimes can be selfish, uh, you know, wanting to indulge their pastime, but um, the idea was that um, they would invest in the charity. The charity acquired the aircraft. Uh, they uh, get the use of the aircraft in return for a monthly fee and, a, and an hourly charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and in return for that low-cost flying that they get, um, we give, uh, we're expected to give pupils uh, and young people free flights, so mm -hmm. that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good when there's multiple benefits to different groups of people from the same thing. It's just getting it started, really, I suppose. Is the COVID knocked it on the head a bit. Um, uh, uh, yesterday we had 17 pupils from Kinross High School round, so they were S2 going into S3. Um, the aircraft's based at Fife Airport at Glen Rothes, wow. and um, we uh, we had the pupils round, so we gave them hangar tours, took them into the control tower, let them do a bit of radio telephony. I I gave them some flight planning briefings, and uh, five of them got a free flight yesterday. The weather conditions weren't weren't ideal. We'd like to have flown more, but. Mm -hmm. Um, we got five of them airborne yesterday. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, an amazing opportunity for, mm. for school kids to be able to do. There was certainly nothing like that when I was at school. <laughs> well, uh, interestingly, one of the young ladies said that uh, she's in the Air Cadets. Yeah. And yeah. she said, oh, we don't get anything like this in the Air Cadets. It's, um, is there Air Cadets in Kinross? There is, yeah. So yeah. I think it's quite small. Um, we need to reach out to them and, and try and engage them a bit more. Mm -hmm. And they do get some flying, I know that for sure, in the, in the cadets, but um, uh, we could perhaps help in some way. Yeah. I guess it's been like a humanity dream for, since the beginning of time to be able to fly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, space is sort of something a little bit beyond that, but it's, it's kind of just a progression of, in, in a way to, to this feeling of uh, what's it like to fly. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I, 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 have you tried hang gliding? Uh, I've done uh, parascending. Um, Is that what they do with? The, just off the back of a boat. Um, oh right, no, that's not what they do up there. They go up. That's the, paragliding. Yeah, uh, uh, so you get paragliding, parascending, parachuting, <laughs> paranormal, <laughs> paralegal. Uh, yeah. yeah, indeed. Um, Yes, it's uh, it's a wonderful hill that because it faces faces west um, into the prevailing winds. It has a relatively smooth uh, shape, and you get a laminar flow uh, over the hill, which creates a hill lift for for glider pilots or hang glider pilots or anyone who can seagulls or buzzards who uh, want to make use of it. No. I, I, it's, the, the other thing that strikes me is it's with gliding it's it's in a way it's like sailing you're going to you've got this you've got the technology and the sort of the this but it's the weather aspect of it too I mean I've done a little bit of sailing. Mm -hmm. Well the pundits the gliding pundits are indeed studying the weather very closely weeks days in advance and they know when the optimal time is to get out of their bed at four in the morning it, uh, it, and uh, get down to the gliding club and get the aircraft rigged uh, and out and launched. Um, you may have heard them going overhead at seven in the morning. Some of the um, really good pilots have uh, made some amazing achievements in gliding from here. Um, and, uh, you know, I would mention uh, one in particular, uh, John Williams, who uh, 
was living locally and uh, I think in one particular, I think of him one particular morning when, when he got up, um, took an early launch and flew his glider from here to Tongue on the north coast of Scotland and from there... No stop? Non stop. And from there down to Mull and then back across from Mull to Port Moak, a distance of 500 kilometres without an engine... Uh, he looked down at the airfield and thought, I'll just go around that again. And he did. In, a in, thousand kilometres, ten and a quarter hours in the air, a UK distance record. Good grief. Was that just, he was just pushing, pushing, he was saying, it's still OK, I can keep, did he have tongue as a target and got... Oh well, yeah, the flight would have been planned... Uh, and it would Days, be, weeks, months in advance. An hour by and hour. Then waiting for the conditions to be right. Uh, to do it so very close uh, observation of the meteorological conditions yeah. and not, I guess not that much higher than the Monroes that he would have been going over uh, probably not and, and uh, I do believe although I haven't seen the evidence personally when he came back in from Mull uh, he was below, well below the height of the Monroes <laughs> um, very skilled pilot and there are a number of others around there uh, who are really terrific uh, uh, soaring pilots uh, who can cover vast distances. And, and do you feel like, as from for, since you started with an interest in gliding, that you're always developing your skills in that in 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 that way t- towards understanding the conditions? And yeah, I was uh, I was a banker, so I needed some excitement in my life. <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought finance was supposed to be, <laughs> you know. Uh, super it was um, really tremendous from a personal development standpoint to take up a sport that stretched me into areas um, that I hadn't previously studied. I've mentioned them before, navigation, meteorology, radio telephony, air law, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but also challenged me uh, mentally, uh, you know, to stretch away from the airfield. You talked about seeing gliders locally, but... It's relatively easy to soar locally, but the challenge is stretching yourself away from the the gliding site. I didn't do anything particularly uh, long distance, but um, uh, there were a number of occasions when I had to land out in a field, and and that, that that's uh, just like that good. because you think I can't keep going, I've yeah, got to, you got to get descend. Back. Yes, I have. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's, there's a few logistics there to rescue the glider and things is, like that, I guess. That is. Uh, it's easier these days because they have pop-up engines, uh, often uh, just behind the uh, the cockpit, they have a little... Uh, 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 and, and, and so you've got a pilot's licence as well? Yes. For, for small planes? Yes. And w- so what about the difference between, you know, the experience of gliding to flying a plane with an engine in it, apart from the noise? Gliding is, is much more um, personally challenging and satisfying on the, the days that you get it right and you, you achieve uh, whatever it is you're, you're trying to achieve. Power flying is a bit more like driving around the sky, um, mm-hmm. uh, but it comes with its challenges as well. And the beauty of it is... Hmm? Have you ever been terrified in a, in, in, in a glider or a plane? No, never terrified. Um, but I have had um, the odd uh, momentary panic. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> um, you know, how is this going to work out? How am I going to get out of this um, situation? But no, generally, the thing is, you when you get into aviation, you, you become a planner and you mm. spend a lot of time preparing and constantly thinking about... Um, uh, emergency situations, what would I do if? This time of the year in a power aircraft is a bit tricky because the crops are all high. There's some, um, same for a glider, there's not many fields that you can actually get into. And without causing a bit of an upset to people. Uh, yeah, or unsettling some uh, cattle or whatever. Uh, um, uh, that's another aspect of it. But basically when you take off, you generally know where you're going to land. That's the plan and it's just a if something takes place on a rare occasion that you would have to do something different? I mean, Absolutely. Um, 
The beauty of power flying is the engine tends to keep purring away in front of you mm -hmm. and you can uh, select where you want to go today. So it might be a lovely day to fly into the mountains or uh, fly around the coast. Um, the west coast of Scotland is fantastic, but the East Nuka Fife is lovely to look mm. at from the air as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it's um, judging the weather and, and where's the optimal place mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. Such a it's 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 the different perspective. I I don't much like flying in you know big aircraft now. I used to really get thrilled by looking out the window at the the, the above the clouds or even below the clouds, and you're seeing this mm. landscape in a way that you never you never normally see it. It's a bit like when you're in an area and you're going along a river or by the on on a boat on the coast, and you see a perspective mm. difference. Mm. And I, I think that's what I would attract me about flying as well, as well as. You don't have traffic. Well, you probably have some traffic considerations in planes, but you go straight. Mm. I mean, it won't take you very hard, very long to get to Ely from <laughs> from here, I guess, does it? No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> no. And do you have to tell people what you're doing? If you if you if you decide you're going to go, you know, fly around the, the, the East Newk and things, you know, tomorrow, would you have to make a kind of like specific? Yes, we're in radio contract with contact with air traffic control. Yeah. 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 So you do, so they can say that's it is, fine. It is possible to go off and, and fly in unrestricted airspace and, and not bother telling anyone about it, but it probably makes sense to uh, yeah. uh, yeah. keep keep in touch and, and let people know, let your traffic controllers know what, what you're planning to do. Yeah, because it's a big sky and you very rarely see anything flying. It's you know it's it's a it's a bit like being in the middle of the ocean on a on mm. a boat really, mm. uh, but you would want to know, <laughs> and especially the speed that things can be travelling at in the air. Very much so. Uh, yeah, yeah. there have been a lot of helicopters recently going back and forward and all these kind of things. So you, yes. There, there, there's that element too. You, how, how would you know about these things when they're... So there's um, what's called NOTAMs, Notices to Airmen. So before we go flying of a morning, we'll check the NOTAMs uh, and that... Uh, uh, military exercise that you're referring to recently was no tammed, as we say. So, Apache helicopters were based at Palado Airfield, and uh, there was a, a kind of uh, warning uh, zone around it to let pilots know that there was a lot of uh, activity in mm -hmm. that in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the the other thing about uh, that I wanted to ask you about that it was in your bio on the flying was the. A charity that uh, you're, that's got something to do with flying or in different countries around the world? To, mm, yeah. What, um, what does that do? So I think you're thinking of Mission Aviation Fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, an amazing uh, organisation. It was uh, It's a Christian missionary organisation formed just after the war uh, with um, three pilots um, uh, who wanted to put what they'd learned... Uh, in terms of destructive flying to a constructive Christian use and they wanted to spread the gospel across uh, well initially the African continent and, and other uh, continents so in 1945 they um, raised enough money to acquire a, a twin engine a light twin engine aircraft and by 1948 they were leave they left Croydon Airport and flew down uh, on what was to have been a ten month aerial survey of Africa to find out if this was feasible. Um, and they got part of the way into that and uh, had a catastrophe. The aircraft was wrecked in the side of a, a mountain in Burundi. But by that time they had uh, learned enough to know that um, uh, there was a real need for for this uh, and. They started fundraising when they got back and, well, it's a long story, but now they fly over 100 aircraft into around 25 countries around the world. Uh, one of their aircraft is taking off or landing every four minutes somewhere and this is into jungle strips and very difficult areas and their whole uh, ethos is to uh, bring... Uh, help, hope and healing to, to people, vulnerable people in remote locations. 
Um, like so is it an emergency situation? So yeah, well, lots of humanitarian yeah. relief, mm -hmm. medi medical evacuations. So they fly all the organisations that are much better known than Mission Aviation Fellowship is. So Oxfam, Save the Children, Tear Fund, you name it, uh, they're flying their, their people uh, into difficult areas. So they'll be in Haiti, for example, after the earthquake. They've been in uh, Ake after the tsunami. Uh, and the pilots are amazing, you know. They're landing these light aircraft in very short, difficult uh, airstrips mm -hmm. uh, with no infrastructure. Uh, flying through um, very turbulent uh, conditions and in, in a these lot countries. less predictability uh, on less. a daily basis than I guess flying yes. in any other yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure that the, you know that it's just uh, and is it just funded through this? I mean, that's quite an expensive charity to do that, isn't it? To to, yes. to run plate, hundreds of planes. Yes, it, it is. It's. Um, so the pilots, for example, will um, partly self-fund themselves. So they'll raise funding uh, for, say, a three-year st st uh, uh, term in, in the likes of Uganda. Um, so um, they'll uh, get uh, support from their local church and their family and whatnot, and uh, MAF will supplement that and uh, send them out and look after them. Mm -hmm. So they have um, bases in places like Uganda, Kenya, uh, and the likes where they have uh, maybe a small fleet of aircraft with maintenance engineers and uh, logistics people and, mm -hmm. dare I say, finance people and whatnot mm -hmm. looking after mm -hmm. operations. It's extraordinary really, isn't it, the amount of things that are happening in the world that for example, just that, I would never have known about it. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that you just generally know. It's not, no. <laughs> We're bombarded by all kinds of media. Yes. Uh, usually it's pretty useless media a lot of the time. <laughs> and, 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 and these things that are happening that people are doing, that's just really what I like about meeting people, actually, is that, that you know, you find out things. Yeah, what, what, so I was an area representative uh, for MEF uh, for about 18 years. and um, but While you were still working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and, and mm -hmm. as retired as well, uh, and um, so I'd go around various um, groups telling the story about MEF and, and so forth. And one that really sticks out in my mind is um, a medical missions in Madagascar, um, where they would fly um, eye surgeons out to clinics. Uh, and you would find uh, that they would run a clinic for maybe a week or two and people would walk in from all over uh, and the story from one of the, the surgeons was told of arriving at a clinic and finding hundreds of people uh, waiting for them to have cataract operations out in the back of beyond um, and uh, the stench of urine was in the air and that's because no one wanted to lose their place in the queue. Um, and, uh, you know, the surgeons would then go uh, at it, hammer and tong. No, well, not quite hammer and tong, <laughs> but... And they've, uh, they've gone out there with their pop-up sort of yeah, surgery. Laser surgery, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And they would do maybe 400 cataract operations or whatever in the course of a couple of weeks. Um, just... Grief. Transforming lives, yeah. Yeah, I mean a simple yeah. enough, op well, relatively simple operation here that people, that surgeons yeah. in hospitals and sure. anyone else can probably do um, routinely. But doing it in that situation yeah. and the the value to the people as well, I think. I mean, mm. it's. So I must uh, apologise for the fact that you have never heard of MAF because it was part of my role as the area representative here to tell people. Well, so I, I, I've failed. just read it on your bio. <laughs> <laughs> obviously failed. Um, well, but one of one of the things that we are hoping to do is uh, have a permanent presence within our uh, aerospace discovery centre that we're looking to create here in Kinross yeah. for MEF. Yeah. Uh, and you know they've got all these humanitarian stories that are changing every day. There's new stuff happening every day. Um, so uh, we're hoping that part of our offering will in incorporate uh, permanent. Uh, 
exhibition and displays and maybe a flight simulator for, yeah. for MEF and the likes of Scotland's charity Air Ambulance. Yeah. The, the, the Aerospace Centre, is it going to be at Velado? Is that, is that still a sort of ongoing... So uh, we've, I've been working site. on this for 10 years, nearly 10 years now. With that site in mind? No, no, no. For years I've been saying, no, no, we're not going to Bellado. Um, uh, and originally my dream was much larger than it has subsequently shrunk to become. Uh, and uh, around five and a half years ago, we applied to um, the Tay Cities deal um, for funding. Uh, we asked for seven and a half million pound towards our vision of creating, spending about twelve and a half million pound on a on a new build. Uh, two years later, I got a phone call from the cabinet office in London to say they had good news for us. Uh, we were getting a grant of one point six million. Yeah. Um, so we initially thought, well, that's not much good to anyone. But then in reflection, we thought, well, what can we do with that? So we scaled back our vision and we've been looking at potentially acquiring the golf ball site at Balado, mm -hmm. former Ministry of Defence satellite communication station, mm -hmm. and repurposing that into our aerospace discovery centre. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can see the, the, the site's location mm -hmm. and... There's a sort of, there's something sort of, in a way, it's not coincidental, but really it's something natural about the evolution of that particular site from what it has been to this plan of this aerospace centre too. Very much so. Uh, it's um, Can't they just, they can't just donate the site? So the site was, uh, the golf ball and the buildings on it, there are three buildings on it. Uh, inside the golf ball is the satellite dish. Have you been in? No, no. It's, it's it's, it, when, when people go in, they, they're quite awestruck by the size of the. Mm -hmm. the it's a fifty-foot diameter. But it's all redundant now. It's just all like, correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and um, we uh, we have looked at those buildings and realised how we can repurpose them uh, into this sort of space side of our vision uh, as a first phase development using this grant award that we've mentioned. And, you, you know, you mentioned the evolutionary aspect of it. So that was uh, satellite communications, um, 50 people working in that site, waiting for an intercontinental ballistic missile, mm. which fortunately never came, mm -hmm. um, and also providing ship-to-shore uh, communications uh, for the military. So it was a NATO site, effectively. Opened, the current buildings were commissioned uh, in 1985 and opened by Princess Anne at the time. Uh, and the MOD occupied them for about 20 years, left in 2006. And an Edinburgh-based entrepreneur bought the site in 2008. Ah, so they don't, they, the Ministry of Defence doesn't own it now. That's correct. Yeah. Ah, so there's a different negotiation with So the... our vision with, with, with particular reference to the golf ball and the satellite dish is to uh, tell a bit of the Cold War story um, mm -hmm. around that and then relate it to modern day earth facing satellites that are so ubiquitous and are having such a big impact on our lives mm -hmm. generally um, from sat nav to agricultural monitoring and climate and all the rest that, that, that's happening um, as, as I'm sure you know Scotland is uh, one of uh, the largest uh, manufacturers of satellites, CubeSats Small, I, didn't, small I, didn't, satellites. I didn't know that. It's one of the largest in Europe. Yeah. What, what, so a cube satellite. What is that? That's that, that's just sending um, radio or whatever. Small it? small cube satellites that go off and how, how small? Uh, have, well, they can be uh, not much bigger than a Rubik cube. Um, as tiny as that. Yeah. yeah just yeah. orbiting around the. Yeah, yeah. So they can put up an array of them, or you know, they can be bigger than that. Obviously. Uh -huh. Good grief. I guess that with the, with the with the aerospace centre, I mean, there's so many things that you could link to that. Mm. 
it's sort of got to be curtailed as to what's going to make the most, at least in the beginning, financial sense, as well as, you know... Very much so. So in 2018, uh, uh, we acquired a, a mobile planetarium business. I read about that on the website. That so sounds good. It, so it's a man in a, man in a van uh, who travels the length and breadth of Scotland in the north of England. He's just back from York. Yesterday he was down in York with his planetarium. So this is an indoor planetarium, six and a half metre diameter, three and a half metre tall. And we can get, say, 25 people at a time in that. And he'll do either presenter-led astronomy or he'll run animated films produced by the likes of NASA or the National Space Centre that take predominantly young people off in an immersive journey into space. So is it like, the, is it projected onto the... Yeah, it's just the, an indoor tent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ha, have you been... This was one of the, another one of these quite uh, magical experiences. I'm pretty sure it was the... I don't know if it was in Dundee or Glasgow. I think maybe it was Glasgow in the Science Centre and they've got have they, is it, they've got a planetarium there. They've got a fixed dome, yeah. Yeah, it will, be, it will have been there. Years ago we went and you go into this dome and then you sit back and it's all dark and then suddenly they switch the lights on and it's the, the cosmos and it was just incredible mm. to see. It is, it is. So we're going to put a fixed dome planetarium in. Uh, uh, the, this mobile one has, that, it has things like that. That's the, the kind yeah. of experience that they're... Yeah, yeah. So they just lie... You just line the floor in our, pla our planet. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for kids. <laughs> you don't fall asleep so easily. Um, no, that's and, it, I mean, does it work, is, it, is it working well? Just through well, uh, in the last 12 months, I think we've had 10,000 people through it. Oh, well, that's got to be good. And, uh, yeah, it's, it works very well. Uh -huh. So that's, the, that, that, that's one strand of it, and then you've got the... And that's going to be based... At Balado. So we're going to, that will we'll continue to operate that outreach um, through that mobile dome, but we'll also have a fixed dome planetarium in, mm -hmm. the, in the building. Mm -hmm. What's the kind of block at the moment for, you know, because you haven't bought the site? I'll give you three guesses. <laughs> Money. <laughs> you got it. One. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, we're um, not finished our fundraising yet. So that 1.6 million I mentioned is the financial foundation upon which we're building a larger uh, pool of uh, funding to be able to acquire the site, repurpose it. Um, and our best case scenario at the moment is we acquire the site later this year and we repurpose it next year and we open to the public in 2025. Okay, that's a timeline. Good. Yeah, most of my timelines are uh, optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you start, you know, it's just like uh, that expression, you know, you, you build your castles in the air because that's where they should be, but then you've got to put foundations. <laughs> yeah, what about these billionaires that are really into space and all the charities, you know, the Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, and they're all into space things and they're not... Got, they're yeah, not, well, um, they all have their pet projects and they pour millions or zillions of, of dollars into them uh, it's um it's quite interesting it's kind of difficult to get the aerospace industry to go into their pockets uh, we've taken the view that um there will be a time when we're ready to ask those organizations to collaborate with us so we want to showcase what they're doing not necessarily, not necessarily glorifying the, what the billionaires are doing in their vanity projects, um, mm -hmm. but rather showing how humankind is exploring the universe and uh, bringing um, practical examples of that uh, into the centre by uh, displaying and showcasing what these organisations are doing. Mm -hmm. So. Getting money from them is probably harder than getting exhibits from them and you know getting them to to take space uh, in the space, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, we also are keen to work with universities uh, and showcase what's happening at the leading edge of research and development. 
But that was another thing that came up. I mean, as a, as a young child, a tiny boy, I remember the moon landing. Well, I don't really remember it, but it was certainly a massive inspiration to me at the time of this incredible thing that, mm. that was taking place. And then, you know, later on, I started to think, it's an awful lot of money it costs to do all these space things, you know. And and then, then I, I, I remember coming across certain facts like PV panels came from... Mm space needing mm. electricity in space and even more relevant to me battery power tools and things like that all developed out of research mm. into mm. into space so the I, I had kind of missed the practicality you know of everyday yeah. benefits yeah. to i mean there's obviously this sort of just amazing wonder of what is it in the universe and that but so our ambition is to inspire young people to uh, want to delve further we don't see ourselves as a research institute or anything grand like that but rather a uh, creating a family oriented visitor attraction where people can come for a few hours uh, get some informal play-based learning uh, and uh, hopefully showcase what's going on in the country uh, lo locally nationally and globally mm -hmm. um, in, in this segment. Uh, so, yeah, we see ourselves probably as the feeder for um, inspiring people to want to go on to, to greater things. And that, that could simply be um, wanting to learn to fly a glider. Mm -hmm. So we would signpost people to the gliding club, wanting to fly a microlight, so we would signpost them to the uh, Balado airfield uh, for, for that or uh, you know it could be hang gliding or whatever um, or if people are looking for uh, more information on uh, aviation heritage then there's the National Museum of Flight at uh, um, East Fortune in East Lothian yeah. uh, if they're looking more for the science side of things then there's the Glasgow Science Centre, Dynamic Earth, Dundee Science Centre. So we would be looking to signpost people to, to those if they wanted to go into... Seems a like a very, very obvious project to, 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 to take off. Um, we, um, we're not finding any resistance locally. Uh, we're finding a lot of support. So we have around... We, we're, we're a charity. We're a community benefit society. And we're registered with Co-ops UK, so we're a cooperative community benefit society with charitable status. Bit of a mouthful, um, but um, the, the the idea is that it's volunteers that are principally behind this, um, and uh, we have a board of about a dozen uh, volunteer uh, trustees um, who look after the corporate governance of, of the thing. Um, and we have um, around 250 um, ordinary life members of the society. So anyone can become a, a member of the society. We'll relieve them of £10 for the privilege as a donation. Uh, and in return for that, they get not very much other than the right to vote uh, and help us uh, with the, the visioning, of, visioning of what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, and then in 2017 we did a community share offer so 100 people actually went into their pockets and gave us some working capital uh, and uh, that raised just over £100,000 and then earlier this year we did a, a bond offer so we offered a, uh, an, an investment bond uh, in the charity and we raised a quarter of a million pound uh, from 100 new investors locally um, or and beyond or just uh, two thirds of the investors came from down south um, and a third are local um, the reason that most investors were based down south was a deliberate ploy on our part we um, a, contracted with an investment management firm in Oxford who have a database of 20,000 socially minded investors uh, so that was our main target uh, uh, audience there, and uh, I guess your career and, and your career helped with yes, that. Yes, yeah, kind of, absolutely. Kind of yeah. Thing, yeah, yeah. And what's the 
because it's the sort of thing you'll have a starting point, like you'll have an, an opening day and point, and then maybe there's on that site at Balado there'll be potential for other things, but you'll start us with a certain amount. What, what, how much money is needed for to get to that point? So we need uh, 3.2 million in total to get to the start point. Mm -hmm. Before you can really say, do right, the first phase. Yeah. You've got the practical, buy it. Yes. Create, are you going to keep the buildings that are there? Yes, we are. And the, and the, the, the golf ball? Yes. Yeah, they'll all ah, just right, be because that's, like, that's iconic. Oh, you, uh, mm -hmm. Without the satellite dish inside, I guess. Without the satellite. Oh, no, it'll stay inside for sure, yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll build a Cold War exhibition around it. I was recently down at Jodrell Bank, um, which is a classic example of a wonderful fusion of the the, the, dis the discovery there. Is a, it's a wonderful f discovery centre. It's a wonderful fusion of heritage and science. Um, Sir Bernard Lovell had been going down there in the uh, 1950s with a deck chair and a telescope and... Uh, where, where is it? It's uh, near Manchester, it's in a rural location mm -hmm. um, but uh, ultimately, and it's very closely associated with Manchester University so it is an active uh, astronomy research station um, and it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site it has, um, I think I'm right in saying this, this the satellite dish there is 70 metres in diameter. It's massive. Um, and, uh, yeah, they would attract something like a quarter of a million visitors a year to that. Um, there's no train service to it. There's no, you know, it's it's in the sticks, a bit like Balado is mm -hmm. here. Um, and uh, our ambition is much more modest. We're hoping to get 50,000 visitors a year to to our site. Well, they coped with tea in the park for however many tens of thousands for a weekend. I mean, it was obviously a little bit, mm. in a sense, disruptive, but it was generally good. It I, was. I it was very well run, wasn't it? And 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 Ken Ross. I mean, I I feel this. Obviously, you get attached. Well, you and your wife are as well. You want to stay here, and there's there's quite a lot of special things about it mm. you know the loch all the different you know, the path around the loch the hills nearby the fact it's rural i mean this i was thinking about this road here that we're on and when i was a teenager and i'd go on my bicycle around and you there's hardly any more traffic on something i mean you get a little bit more in milnathort high street and kim mm. high street but the rural roads there's hardly any more traffic than there would have been 30 40 years ago but it's, it's got a, a lot of attractions you know one of one of the other things we we're looking to do is create a space missions area so you remember the space shuttle challenger that exploded on yeah. launch 1986 they had seven astronauts on board one of whom was a a female uh, teacher uh, Kirsten McAuliffe uh, and uh, after that tragedy the families wanted to leave a lasting legacy so they um he started to build Challenger Learning Centres across the United States. They were very well connected with NASA and the top politicians of the day. Um, and they got a lot of uh, funding. And there are now 40 of these uh, Challenger Learning Centres across the US and Canada. And we've been accepted as an emerging site for a Challenger Learning Centre here in Scotland. We would be the only one in the UK, in fact. Um, and what that would involve is bringing in a busload of kids um, uh, and giving them a challenge. So I've seen 30, 14-year-old kids arrive at a challenger centre. They go into a briefing area. The flight director tells them what their mission is for the day. So these kids were tasked with putting a probe on a comet as you would when you're 14. Mm -hmm. uh, half of them are put into a virtual transporter and virtually transported off to a virtual space station. The other half go into a virtual, well, an actual mission control with all the screens and whatnot, and they have the headphones and they're in communication with the other half of their cohort who are in the space station. And then they, uh, they run the, the flight directors run the challenge and they've got various tasks that they have to do to go through the challenge. So the kids are all having fun, they're in a sort of spacey environment, really enjoying it. 
and then the uh, flight crew start to throw emergencies at them. So it's all about communication skills, problem solving, teamwork, mm. all these soft skills that mm -hmm. people need in their lives. Kids are having a great time. You know, they're in there for a few hours and uh, they come out uh, thinking they've played a game, but in fact they've been yeah, I mean, experiencing some personal development. Aye, aye. and you mm. know, it's sort of like taking a trip to Disneyland and, and Disneyland just seems like superficial you know, okay, a bit of fun getting thrown around in a whatever it is little thing, but doing that, yeah, I could imagine that could really. And this is was this in America that you you, that you went to this was Challenger that, Centre? It was actually in Leicester, where the National Space Centre is. So mm -hmm. the National Space Centre in Leicester was Millennium Commission funded, uh, and they uh, had a Challenger Centre there, uh, which was operational for about twenty years. They decommissioned it, and they've done their own thing uh, on space missions. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, but um, yeah, it was in Leicester that I saw that. I wonder if it's another one of these things, like because it, because so much comes down to the allocation of funding from different, you know, whether it's individuals who have the money to fund things or or governments and authorities. And I, I for a short time tried forest school, you know, as a thing as an activity I'd, in, in oh, woodland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought it was quite good for a lot mm -hmm. of kids to get out into woodlands and do these activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, the difficulty that I came up against to, uh, to make it like as a viable type of business was just that although teachers and schools were very pro the whole idea, knowing what, that a lot of kids benefit a lot from that type of thing and not from sitting in the classroom, it was like the practicalities of funding it and the way that they had to do it, you know, Paying travel and yeah. different mm. people and mm. it, 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 there just wasn't the funding for it. And that, that seems to be a real sticking point in a lot of otherwise obviously beneficial projects. It definitely is and um, the likes of the Glasgow Science Centre have got around that by um, arranging um, a top level funding with local authorities for example. Mm -hmm. um, Glasgow Science Centre have relatively recently installed what they call the Newton Flight Academy. So they have three uh, full motion flight simulators uh, and they've, they've put it, set aside a whole area where they can do pre-flight briefings, uh, set a task, and then the, the pupils fly the task in these simulators. Uh, and that's how they've got around that. So it's uh, you need to be um, making those arrangements at the, at the top level, if you like, with the local authorities, so that at the individual school level, they're not uh, scrambling around trying to find yeah. three hundred pounds to to hire a coach for a morning. Yeah, yeah, that that's I, I, that's all. It often does come down to that. You've got to get through to the right person mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. in, in the, at the right time too, mm -hmm. <laughs> who's able to say, "Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Let's go." <laughs> yes. Ah, yeah. uh, well, good luck with that, <laughs> Alistair. I mean, I, 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 it it does seem such an obvious thing to do, and I, I like the idea of that site. Uh, where could be better? It's the heart of Scotland. And what else? Yes, very much so. Uh, half of Scotland's population live within one hour's drive of here. Um, so that's very much a part of our selling. And, and the person who owns it, or the company that own it just now, did they have a purpose or did they just buy it as a... Did they have a plan for... That was so he acquired it at the time of the financial collapse. He was on a cruise and his financial advisor told him to get his money out of the banks, PDQ. Uh, because at that time uh, the banks were, um, shall we say, a bit rocky. <laughs> um, and uh, he decided to put it into property and he, he bought uh, some unique properties. Uh, and this is one that he struggled uh, to, to develop. He wanted uh, or envisaged that it could be developed for housing, but uh, it hasn't worked out for him. So our use for it is really quite... It, unique and well suited to repurposing those buildings um, and uh, it's nine acres in total so it gives long-term potential for yeah. future development yeah and is that, and there'll be all the kind of necessary things there power and water and drainage and stuff like that that's yeah and he's not interested in just sort of being part of it and not actually getting money for the site uh, not so far, no. Because that would be a kind of, uh, you know, just a, like a share, a big share of the of the ongoing whatever it is. Yeah, uh, I, I did offer him the opportunity to buy bonds in our bond, a recent bond issue, but he, uh -huh. he showed some interest in it, so 
Who knows? Yeah. Uh, he might. He might. You know, he and his wife effectively tend the site and they look after it. They get the grass cut every fortnight, and um, although it's starting to look um, very tired and very much in need of a facelift. The buildings are just MOD functional buildings. There's mm-hmm. no fancy architecture about them. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the attraction for yeah. us. Uh, the main technical... Utilita- ut- sort of utilitarian, but practical. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Things that are watertight and whatnot. The main uh, former technical building uh, is, uh, to all intents and purposes, brick on the outside, but inside is a steel box. Um, so it was uh, an electromagnetic pulse shield so it wasn't uh, going to uh, have any uh, uh, radio interference if I can put it in those simple terms into the into the technical building so that steel box is still inside there oh no there's nothing underground is there like a... there's a there's a tunnel between the dome uh, and the uh, the technical building, but it's a sort of crawl through tunnel type thing. There's oh. nothing underground. Uh, there has been uh, local folklore that there's a lot underground. If uh, there is, we yeah. haven't found it. Well, there could be a tunnel to the castle on the island. <laughs> 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 ah, well, yeah. And and and, and is there is there, I mean, do you feel there's a risk that they might you might sell it to somebody else? Very high risk. Um, we. Um, there's a bit of a dichotomy there. He's been trying to sell it for about 14 years and it hasn't gone in anywhere else. Uh, he'd like to sell it uh, in, uh, in its entirety to one buyer. He is an entrepreneur. He, he just wants his money and he just wants out. Um, but he's thinking that uh, if our plans don't come through to fruition, then he'll sell it off in lots, in, in plots. So it could be lost. We could find that the... Um, the whole uh, site is demolished. Um, mm-hmm. Jeez, we do have other options. Uh, this has become our preferred option because of the synergy with the space side of yeah, what yeah. we're doing and what you mentioned earlier about the evolution of satellite applications uh, and all of that. It just fit. Plus, it's it's very accessible from the motorway. Yeah. It's very visible and iconic. It's a perfect site for us to be. Yeah. Starting our little venture and yeah. hoping to grow uh, yeah. in years to come. Yeah, I, I think that, and keeping, I, I, I had sort of assumed that the whole, the, the golf ball would would be gone with any development there because it's this great big thing. But to actually use that as the, what is it? Is it like a plastic? It's uh, like fiberglass. Yeah, it's uh, like a right. drop skin. Yeah. Uh, so it, it doesn't get, well, if you press it with your finger, it doesn't give. There's no, you know, it's like a drum skin, but you can cut it with a Stanley knife. Yeah. Mm. Ah, yeah, it seems very fragile. Yeah, it's been there for. I mean, 40, yeah, there's been a break. Years. There was a break in recently uh, where they cut it with uh, with a, a Stanley knife to get in. What do they do? Fix it with a like a. Well, at the moment it's gaffer taped up. We will need to do a proper job of restoring it. You know, it's mm-hmm. looking very tired and dirty. Um, we'll be testing the materials and doing a proper refurb uh, of of it. But it's a geodesic structure, uh, triangular um, units all bolted together that creates mm-hmm. the the dome. So inside you see the frame the, the, of well, steel or something like that mm. that makes it all up and then there's this great big satellite that would have revolved. Mm. Well, well, I hope to see that one day. I hope to <laughs> like to see it uh, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah. Ah, well, that's great, Alistair. Thanks very much for... Could, uh, no, the opportunity no I think it's just fascinating I think mm. so many people in this area is, there can't be much opposition to that sort of thing well um, we're looking to create 25 jobs and uh, you know that's the uh, and to, as I've said earlier inspire young people so hopefully most people would be on site with that kind of vision I, I think so and it's the technology age as well mm. which has got quite a bit quite a way to run I think as, as far as I can tell and uh, people aren't going to get tired of wondering about you know, flight in space. <laughs> we shall see. We shall indeed. Okay. <laughs> Onward. Right. All right. Thanks a lot, Alistair. It's my pleasure. Thank you.